Good afternoon. We're just getting ready to start here. Uh, this is the National Infant, Child, and Youth Mental Health Consortium uh, webinar, Why Can't My Kids Get Help? Uh, so we'll be ready to start in just a few moments. Uh, just to let you know that all lines are muted. And uh, right now we have around 60 lines open. We will be having uh, question and answers after the presentations are completed. And you'll see that you have a control panel in the right-hand side of your screen. You can write your questions in there at any time. At the end of the presentations, I will be uh, sending those questions off to the presenters to answer. And we will also be recording the presentation and posting it on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. And everybody online will receive a notification of when that, uh, when that link goes up. So right now I'm going to hand things over to Elaine Orbine. Uh, President and CEO of the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. Thank you, Lisa. And I, I want to just let everyone know that it was Lisa Stromquist, uh, uh, CAFC's national coordinator of our mental health programs, as well as quality and safety, who, who is, is really facilitating the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to some of our colleagues in the, in the West Coast. It truly is an honor for me to facilitate uh, today's webinar, and first and foremost, to thank everyone for participating and joining us uh, today. And um, it is really on behalf of the National Infant, Child, and Youth Mental Health Consortium and our two co-chairs, Ian Mannion and Kelly Anderson, that I would like to welcome everyone to the consortium's second national webinar. We are truly honored today to welcome two colleagues and internationally renowned content experts, and that is uh, Dr. Patrick McGrath and uh, Dr. Mandy Newton, um, who will really be leading today's webinar. And we are going to have a, tr a wonderful opportunity to interact together through the um, wonders of the webinar technology participate in some active electronic polls, and really have your voice and your, um, your thoughts be reflected in, uh, in the next 90 minutes as well. As Lisa mentioned, uh, the focus of today's webinar is why can't my kid get help, issues and access to child and youth mental health. And this is certainly an area that Pat and Mandy have dedicated a tremendous amount of their careers and passion to. And I know that we're going to take away a tremendous learning um, from what uh, they're going to be sharing with us today. I just very briefly wanted, for those who may not be as familiar with the consortium, um, the Infant, Child, and Youth Mental Health Consortium was established in 2008. And the concept and need for this consortium really came from a wonderful and very important mental health symposium that was held in 2007 in conjunction with CAFC's annual meeting that year. It was um, the consortium's primary mission is really to actively champion the development as well as implementation of a cohesive infant, child, and youth mental health national action plan. There's a huge advocacy role, knowledge translation, sharing of information really behind the work of the um, consortium. There are, the consortium is truly an alliance of many organizations and individuals who have come together based on that common goal and vision to improving the mental health of all Canada's children and youth. And again, um, certainly Pat and Amanda have dedicated a tremendous amount of time and, um, and commitment to that goal. Um, I, I'd like to extend a, a very warm welcome, uh, first of all, to our consortium members who are online with us and um, on, the, on the webinar together today. But I'd also like to extend an invitation to those who are meeting the consortium for the first time today to consider coming and joining us in a more formal way and um, just getting in touch with either Lisa or myself through the CAFC office. 
we can certainly direct you in, uh, in how we can make that happen. So without any further um, delay, it is my pleasure to um, turn our focus to our presentation today. And as I mentioned, um, Dr. Dr. Patrick McGrath will lead us off. And Pat is, uh, first of all, a longtime colleague and someone that I have admired and learned a great deal from um, over many years now. Pat is the Vice President of Research at the IWK Health Center uh, in Halifax, of course, and Pat is also Professor of Psychology, Pediatrics, and Psychiatry at Dalhousie University. Pat is a leading researcher on pediatric pain, the Center for Pediatric Pain Research, and on distance treatment to increase access to psychosocial health care. And that certainly will, have, um, will, will come out very clearly in, in today's presentation. Pat's research has been recognized by appointment to the Order of Canada and election to the Royal Society of Canada and the Academy of Health Sciences of Canada. Pat has received numerous other awards. Um, and, uh, and Pat's bio, of course, will, uh, will be posted with our podcast and uh, presentation from today's webinar. And uh, Pat, we are just thrilled that you can join us. Pat's colleague and, and um, also uh, internationally renowned content expert, um, Amanda Newton. Mandy is a clinician scientist, and her training has focused on addressing multi-level change to improving the care of children and youth with mental health needs. Mandy obtained her Bachelor of Nursing from McMaster University in 1999, and then a PhD with advanced clinical training in psychiatry with a clinical behavior science, sciences program through the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences, also at McMaster. Mandy has done a postdoctoral training in knowledge translation from the University of Alberta, and that was in 2007. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome both Pat and Mandy to this afternoon's webinar. And I believe, Pat, we're going to turn the podium over to you uh, to begin the presentation. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. In, um, and we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to so many of our colleagues. The first point that I probably doesn't have to be made in much detail, but I'd like to go over it, is that mental health problems are very common in children. Uh, they're as common in children as they are amongst adults. A uh, recent meta-analysis of 44 studies done by the Institute of Medicine uh, determined that 18% of children have a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. And in the next slide, we can see that um, the, some of the examples, so the, uh, I said 17% or 18%, 6.1% of kids have disruptive behavior, 8% have anxiety. Comorbidity is where you have more than one disorder is more likely to occur uh, than, than not. Sorry, that's not quite true. Comorbidity is common. Um, the onset of symptoms is often early in disruptive behaviors. Uh, the uh, Institute of Medicine found in four to five years of age, anxiety at eight years, and substance abuse at 12 years. Uh, mental, emotional, and behavioral problems are linked to poverty not specifically to race or ethnic status, although of course those uh, groups that are, are generally poor have more uh, mental and emotional behavior problems. Not only do these problems affect children, they also predict the future, they predict adult disorders, they predict school failures. Um, children when they are, are in their teens are more likely to have unplanned pregnancy, more likely to be involved in crime. It has a huge effect on, uh, on, on families. Uh, parental depression is common. Um, it disrupts the family and, and has a huge cost to society in terms of, of issues like uh, failure to be employed and difficulty uh, with, uh, with the law. This is a graph, from, again, from the, uh, from the uh, um, Institute of Medicine, uh, just showing the percent prevalence. As you can see, there's uh, considerable variation in studies, uh, but you've, you can see across that the, the numbers that are just under the graph show the numbers of studies that looked at it. So one or more dis disorders uh, is uh, 
the mean is around 16, 17, 18 percent. The uh, um, and the range, of course, is quite considerable. And then you move down to things like uh, like uh, panic disorder, which is uh, which is again, although important, is is a low number. Um, and and you can see the ver variety in terms of the prevalence. And on the next slide, you see the uh, again the age of uh, uh, first symptom and age at first diagnosis. One of the things that's important is is that uh, you can see that uh, oftentimes uh, the uh, the first symptom occurs a couple of years before the diagnosis occurs. The next slide shows the uh, a question for the audience, um, and this is uh, ha I haven't said this of course is what percentage of children with a diagnosis of mental health disorder receive specialist care? Um, and this is uh, you're supposed to answer this question on your slide. Uh, you can select one: four to seven percent, fifteen to twenty percent, forty to fifty percent, or seventy-five to eighty-five percent. So, if you can do that right now. All right. So we've had eighty-two percent of our participants, and we have over one hundred lines with us. So, Lisa, the results are. So seven percent. Uh, Sixty percent of people said seven percent. Thirty-eight percent said twenty percent. Two percent, fifty percent and 0%, 75 to 85%. Well, it's very interesting that nobody thinks that uh, 75 to 85% of kids who have diagnosable disorder receive specialist care, and about hardly anybody thinks that uh, even half of them. The correct answer from the best evidence that we have is, uh, is about one in six children. Um, and this is the next slide. So the data is uh, from two studies in Canada, Waddell and, and, and Offord, as about 84% haven't received specialist care. So most kids, only 16% receive specialist care. Um, what that means, of course, is, is that either these kids are not being cared for at all or they're being cared for in primary care. And the problem is, is that in primary care, there's extremely limited ability for primary care specialists to uh, manage these children, both because of their of the training that primary care specialists have received, not not that they couldn't be trained, but most aren't trained, and also because of the structure of primary care makes it very difficult for primary care practitioners to spend more than just a few minutes with each patient, and many of the treatments for um, children's mental health problems require more than a few minutes uh, at each visit. And the next slide shows the another question. Um, is this uh, put up for question? What predicts service when your brakes don't work? Problems you're having with the car or the preference or specialty of the garage? If people could answer that question. And you may say, well, why is he asking questions about automobile repair? But you'll see that with the next question. There we go. And of course, um, some people have worse problems with the garage than I do. But usually when I bring my car, it's 60 and 40 percent. Usually when I bring my car in um, and I say it's the brakes, they try and fix the brakes. But I guess that. Uh, may not be the uh, the case of uh, everybody. And the next question is, what predicts treatment when your child has a mental health problem? The problem of the patient or the preference or orientation of the mental health professional? And the answer is? And what people have said here is, is that, uh, that mental health professionals are, are in terms of the preference or orientation of mental health professionals is 71 percent determines what the treatment is going to be and the problem of the patient is 29 percent. And the point that I want to make with this is, is that I think, uh, as, as the audience does, is, is that the system is provider oriented. You get what I give, not what you need. So rather than um, evidence, scientific evidence, or any type of evidence determining whether or not you get a specific off uh, treatment, it's the kids. The treatment should be fitted with the kid's problem, not with the provider's orientation or preferences. If we were truly giving uh, service to families, that's the way it should be. Next slide, please. 
the care given is often perceived as not being family and patient centered. I have no data on this except my own experiences the, and, and the experience of many of my colleagues that in talking to families, they often do feel that they haven't received the care uh, that was organized for them, it was organized for the professional. And this is something that is, is, is hotly contested by when I, when I suggest that to my colleagues. Um, the principles of, of um, uh, the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care for Family-Centered Care is respect and dignity, res listening to and honoring patients and family perspectives and choices, knowledge, values, beliefs, and cultural backgrounds are incorporated into the planning and delivery of care, the information sharing is complete and unbiased, the participation, uh, participating in care and decision making at the level that they choose, and collaboration with the patients and family in policy and program development. And my perception is, is that often this isn't done. And, and some of the indications that I would say is, is that um, many times, for instance, letters and, and, uh, are not sent. Sometimes they are, and, and it's getting much better. But many times letters are sent to doctors, uh, to referring agents, that aren't shared with the, with the family. Uh, records are often uh, hidden away. Uh, families don't have access to their own records unless they, uh, they get very stroppy about it there isn't the complete information sharing. And they don't participate in the, uh, in the care and decision making. Oftentimes services are delivered um, at times and in places that are convenient for the, uh, for the professionals, and not at times in places that are convenient for the patients. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the access points for, in Canada for mental health care, we have to understand it is not just the traditional mental health services. Um, there's also primary care, uh, and GPs, family physicians, and pediatricians. There's also school counselors, uh, social workers, either in, in family services or in, in, in uh, many different uh, environments. Complementary and alternative medicine is also playing a role. Uh, the internet and web, and also families get a lot of information from self-help books or uh, columns uh, or uh, also one source that isn't mentioned here is, is the uh, is, is availability of help from, from the clergy or from trusted family and friends. Which of the five services below do you think are utilized most by families? Psychiatrist, psychologist, primary care, GP, a social worker, counselor, other service dots listed above, and that is for mental health services. And the answer is? Psychiatrist 1%, psychologist 1%, primary care, GP, family physician, and pediatrician 80%, social worker, counselor 11%, other service dots listed above 7%. Mandy, do you want to talk this through, please? Sure. So this is the next slide. Um, and I'll, I'll go to um, Chung and Dewa's study, I guess, in 2007 here, because I think it probably relates a little bit more. Um, so these were youth with major depressive disorder. And this study was done a few years back. But um, it does show, in terms of youth, seeking, uh, youth preferences for treatment seeking, who they see. And I think it reflects a little bit of the audience's opinions in, in terms of who people go to. Um, and there were some striking differences between boys and girls, most not notably for social worker and counselor. Um, services, but some comparable preferences between GPs and family physicians or primary care, um, as uh, the polling question um, pointed out, and some differences between those youth that go to see a psychiatrist um, between boys and girls, 45% of boys. So Pat, I'll, I'll take you back to the how parents seek help for their children, and then I'll skip over the other slide for you if you want. Okay, so the uh, parents uh, on average in a study by Shanley and Reed uh, at Western Ontario, and Evans at Western Ontario, the University of Western Ontario, found that many families, in Ontario at least, were seeking help for at least two different child problems. They contacted at least five different agencies for professional help and were receiving two different treatments. And that, that is in, the, uh, in that area of the country. Um, my opinion, although I don't have any data, is, is that that may not be true across the country depending on the availability of of uh, options for service. So, for example, in Nova Scotia, there's, there's many fewer options for uh, service. Um, from whom do youth prefer to receive treatment information from family physician? 48% to school, 42%. Um, have, we don't know if, if, if since in the 10 years since then, if the, uh, uh, if the information seeking behaviors have changed. In a study that we did, 
uh, a couple of years, uh, a year and a half ago, is that uh, we found that uh, youth in, this was a sample from rural Nova Scotia, um, the preferences for depression treatment, and these were in general uh, kids, these were general population of kids, they were uh, uh, much preferred talk therapy with a family physician or a psychiatrist and a psychologist or a psychologist over medication. There was a strong preference uh, for talk therapy rather than medication for depression among this sample. In the next slide. So some of the challenges with our current mental health care system is the it's fragmented. There's a silo style of service delivery. There's poor communication between different service sectors. Um, certainly, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes social services doesn't talk to health, health doesn't talk to the schools, nobody talks to justice, um, and all of these locations may be, um, may be uh, sources of treatment. The location, family, child barriers, uh, are, there's considerable, they have to often travel, um, there's a lack of uh, enough psychologists, psychiatrists, and, and, and so on to provide the service. Rural communities in some cases are extremely poorly served. Some cases they're very well served because they have good services. And the stigma occurs, uh, the stigma is, is true across all communities, but it may be more evident in smaller communities when if your car ends up in front of the mental health clinic uh, the next week in the, uh, in the grocery store, somebody will be asking you, oh, was that, that was your car in front of the mental health clinic last week, wasn't it? And so it, it's oftentimes is a reason for, uh, for people not attending. The costs and efficiencies are needed. We don't have a lot of data on, on cost effectiveness in children's mental health care. And of course the issue of a stigma in, uh, in, if, in a community, if your child gets cancer, uh, all the community will rally around. And certainly in Nova Scotia, people will hold bake sales to help you be able to travel to the center and they'll, they'll bring casseroles over and lobsters and so on. But if your child has a mental health problem, uh, they will gather around to gossip about you. And uh, there's really a lot of stigma for having a mental health problem. Next slide, please. What system challenges the most urgent in Canada? Silo style service delivery, shortage of mental health care providers, location of services, lack of funding, or other challenges not listed. What is your opinion? I don't think there's any data on this, but we really appreciate your opinion. And I agree, Pat. It, it's very important to get the opinion of our colleagues who are participating this afternoon. There's always a hidden, um, hidden agenda, and I'll make it very transparent, and that is that the discussions and feedback that we receive on our various webinars really provide us with some information and, and perhaps recommendations for moving some of our common agendas forward. So another reason that your, your feedback is extremely important. And I think the reason why people are having difficulty is, is that you might want to say all of the above. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there, there, there are your results, Pat. Right. Pretty well. Uh, so silo style service delivery is identified by 35 percent. Shortage of mental health care providers by 27 percent. Five percent location of services. Lack of funding, 28 percent. And other challenges not listed, five percent. And unfortunately, we didn't put in all of the above uh, um, uh, box or choice in there. It was uh, an oversight on our part. Next slide, please. Mandy, are you going to take over now? I, I think it's to... still you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. My, my so, slide, the queue, I think, comes up after all of your strongest fans. Okay, so some of the things that have been identified as important um, is the, the idea that wherever a fa every door is the right door policy. So wherever a family goes for help, they should not be put in the position of saying, of sitting on a waiting list for weeks or months and then being told, oh, this isn't the right waiting list for you. You should have been on the other waiting list. We'll put you on the other waiting list, or maybe you should go on the other waiting list. And so to wait for another several um, several months before you get care. That's a certainly in many people's experience. That's that's quite common. The um, we really have to start developing an innovative workforce, and for caregivers, we we have to think more than given the high prevalence of disorders 
it's going to be very difficult if we if we just stay in the same um, approaches that we've always been using. We really have to start fostering more collaborative uh, um, collaborative work so that we can actually uh, serve the families that we wish to serve. And and that would I'm sorry I lost my slide for a second. And and we have to foster collaboration between primary care, mental health services, social services, justice, and so on. And I'm going to tell you now about a, a project that we've been doing for a number of years, and this is called Strongest Families, and this is a cover of our, of our workbook for the active child uh, intervention for that. And um, we've developed this in conjunction with practitioners and decision makers here in Nova Scotia with the support of a of the uh, of a large number of investigators and uh, of course strong support from uh, from several funding sources. So how does it work? Um, we the uh, child is referred, uh, the family is referred. It depends on on which program we're we're doing. We, we are now doing this as a service, um, but in some of our studies, there's different different referral patterns. So we put them into the family strongest family system. We assign a coach, and we send them handbooks and videos and a password. The coach calls to the family one, uh, once a week at, at convenient call times during the day, the evening, the weekend. Um, in the disruptive disorders, we only talk to a parent. In the anxiety disorders, we talk to both parents and kids. Uh, the evidence is, is that talking to kids about disruptive behavior um, and direct teaching with kids isn't, um, there's, there's not much evidence for its efficacy, uh, whereas parent training, there's lots of evidence for efficacy. Um, we record all of our interactions for quality assurance, and we follow very strict risk management protocols. Next slide. Pat, I, it's Elaine. I'm just going to jump in here and say sure. that I'm also thrilled that your Strong Family program is, is coming to the CAFC conference this year. There will be an actual exhibit and booth set up through the entire conference, so you and your colleagues will be able to bring this program to, to many of our, of our colleagues from across the country and really share this information in great detail. Right. And what, what this is, is it's a, it's a mental health intervention in which we teach skills to, to families. Um, the first skill that we teach is uh, noticing the good. This is an example from our handbook. We also do it on the. We're also doing it now on the web, uh, just setting up web-based systems um, and uh, focusing on on teaching specific skills. So as you can see from this slide, it's very detailed about things that that uh, that you can do that parents can do, and not just telling them to notice good behavior, but detailing how they can do that. And the coach walks through each of these lessons as we see them. These are, are lessons that they walk through with them. And they're, uh, they're taken from the traditional, the dozens and dozens of different approaches to um, parenting uh, uh, groups and parenting interventions. And we've relied particularly on uh, Chuck Cunningham's intervention, um, which uh, we found particularly um, as good data and also was uh, in keeping with our own uh, philosophy of treating the parent as an expert. Next slide, please. Uh, the, co the coaches, uh, everybody asks us what are the coaches. The coaches, we select the coaches on the basis of their skills, not on the basis of their education. This is non-professional coaches. Uh, they have excellent communication skills. They're bright, capable, personable. Uh, they're of all ages, both sexes. Um, ability to problem solve, team player, and they f have to follow risk management protocols, and they take an intensive training program. It, initially, the program is about two weeks to start, and then we provide very close monitoring and ongoing uh, training. So it's, first of all, they read some material, then they practice uh, in a, uh, with, a, with a, a, a trainer, and then they, uh, they uh, actually then have to go on the phones and do it. They listen to previous examples, and then eventually they get to see a family, and then that recording is gone over in great detail. So the role of the coach is to guide the family through the, uh, through the material. They track the progress. They encourage and support. Uh, they're real cheerleaders for families, uh, problem solving. Um, they ensure the compliance. 
it's supervised by a senior coach and eventually there's a professional involved uh, and as I mentioned we uh, we uh, record all all uh, interactions and there is a healthcare professional on call 24/7 uh, although we emphasize that we're not an emergency service and we we get we get very few calls actually because people understand and we, we detail for them what they're supposed to do in an emergency. And the next slide shows an example of an early, an early version of our web-based uh, material um, and it just gives the list of the skills that we're teaching and that's the, uh, the chapters. So noticing the good when there's more than one child spreading attention around, ignoring whining and complaining, uh, transitional warnings and using when-then statements. So we're going to be uh, starting bedtime in five minutes. We're going to be starting bedtime in three minutes. Um, and uh, when you pick up your toys, then you can have a have a time on the computer. Is a, an example of a when then statement. Planning ahead um, is oftentimes uh, families don't realize they have to plan ahead when they want to ha do something and work out the contingencies and work out the problems. Charts and stickers are very useful because they allow us again to provide positive feedback to families. We use timeout. Many families say, oh, I know how to use timeout and it doesn't work. Well, we teach them how to use timeout appropriately uh, and it usually does work. Again, planning ahead for community activities or times when you're absent. Working with the school. We use a daily report card with school or daycare. Uh, find it very effective. It has to be very simple for the family to use and for the teacher to use. And we teach parents how to approach their teacher. It is much more effective if they approach the teacher in a positive way uh, than in a negative way telling the teacher what she's doing wrong. Um, so for each area we have uh, about four or five videos at least and uh, the, to show the skills and then the coach walks them through it and we have the, uh, the handbook or the, uh, the material on the web. And this is um, this is a, so there's a redundancy, we're teaching skills, it's, it's not rocket science in a way, but it's harder to learn to change your behavior um, and many of the families that, that, not all of the families, but many of the families with anxiety of their own anxiety problems, many of the families with uh, disruptive behavior have, their, have uh, difficulty in managing their own behavior. So it, it's a challenge and our coaches uh, do a very good job. Next slide please. These slides are, are slow to change. I'm not sure why. Here's some more material from the this time from the anxiety module teaching to give you an idea of uh, part of the things we do in, in that is changing negative thoughts to positive thoughts. Uh, but as you probably all know that the critical element in reduction and management of anxiety is actually uh, learning to face your anxiety and cope with the negative feelings. Uh, be able to tolerate some anxiety feelings and be able to go ahead and do things. So we teach the child and we teach the parent in the anxiety module. And again, we have videos and we have uh, um, we have uh, lots of examples and specific examples on on the uh, in the material. Next slide, please. Um, we use a coach's corner. Um, we we got that idea from somebody else in. Um, in uh, Don Cherry and uh, we have a monthly group discussion with all of the coaches. Um, the issues are brought up by coaches and feedback from the director. Either I chair this or, or Dr. Trish Potty chairs this who's the uh, uh, one of the other senior people and we just have a free-for-all discussing uh, different issues with the coaches, issues that they found uh, challenging. Uh, they of course have supervision every week from uh, a senior coach and that senior coach goes through every case sometimes very very quickly uh, but sometimes you have a lot of discussion. Next slide please. So the advantage to the families is, is that they're, they're, they are truly treated as a respected partner. We work with our staff a lot on customer relations um, and uh, it, we want our staff to treat our families as valued partners, not as people who have difficulties or problems. They have privacy by learning at home, convenient appointment times. Our staff work till, uh, uh, till midnight uh, on occasion. I was just talking to the staff today and she's, she's going to be uh, working till midnight. Not on Friday. They, they usually like to get off early on Friday, so we allow them to. We, we schedule have scheduling systems and we're, 
we're allow, we allow our staff to have a lot of flexibility. The key is, is to hire staff with the expectation that they're going to be working um, these hours. Um, they, the families get consistent evidence-based care. The care is designed with the best science in mind. They don't have to travel. They don't have to take time off work. Of course, the materials are free. They have toll-free access when they want. And because we can gear up quickly, there's no waiting list. It takes um, 15 years to train a psychologist. It takes uh, a, a much shorter time. These are some of our data from uh, a publication that's now in press at the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry um, and looks at the, uh, uh, the first, there's three trials here, one for opposition defiant disorder, there were 80 kids uh, in it, and the outcomes were whether or not, they all came in with a disorder, and the outcomes were whether or not they had a disorder at the end. So what we see is, is that um, we get strong effects going across for OBD, we get strong effects with some wearing out after a year. So 365 days after randomization, there isn't quite as strong an effect. So, which suggests to us that they prob that families probably need more booster sessions. We do give typically 10 sessions and then two booster sessions, but they probably need more help uh, in maintaining um, their success. And these are f fairly um, rigorous criteria, so that they came in with a disorder and to be successful that I had to leave without a disorder. ADHD, similar results. Again, a slightly different pattern, but, but pretty similar results. And what we see is, is that over time, there be slight improvement over time with the kids with ADHD. Now, this was a practical trial, and kids were allowed to uh, be on medication um, in, the, in the trial. But of course, if they were still if they weren't having symptoms, they wouldn't have got into the um, into the trial. So they had to. Uh, we asked them to maintain uh, as steady a state as possible in terms of of uh, uh, medication. Uh, and the, with the anxiety, again, we see a slightly different pattern. Again, is is that there seems to be a slight delay in the uh, in the effectiveness, uh, but again, excellent results over time, um, where we see uh, uh, nice odds ratios. And if you combine in the next slide is the combination for all the overall analysis and you see uh, uh, of course when you combine it you see even better results over time. In the next slide um, we've now um, implemented strongest families in a service component and these are uh, 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 the uh, effect sizes this is taken from the BCFEI the Beef Child Fat Bone interview and we took all of the we've We've, we've uh, what we this graph represents is those kids that had clinical levels of uh, BCFPI scores and what the effect was over over time. So what you see is is that the uh, the uh, clinical levels um, are uh, substantially reduced over time. So you have kids in above uh, with the blue line before treatment and then after treatment you see substantial reductions and the effect sizes are, uh, are given in the green bar. Uh, next slide, please. And this is your last one, Pat. Yes, and this is the uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, you can see that uh, the uh, families are, are, are uh, outrageously pleased with it. Um, and the, um, the only thing that is an area that I feel that we have to make a bit of improvement in is the uh, participation, although we should always be improving, is participation in planning. Because we're using uh, paraprofessionals in uh, using a defined curriculum, there is a weakness to some extent, although it's still pretty high satisfaction rates, uh, there is a, a bit of a weakness in participation in planning. They don't feel that they've had enough say in how they plan it. And we're working on ways of increasing um, the uh, uh, participation in the planning of the intervention with the uh, with the families and that's uh, going to be uh, rolled out in our next iteration and I'll hand over the microphone to uh, uh, Mandy now. Thanks very much Pat. I'm going to put a disclaimer before I get started. Well Pat was talking a strange brown liquid started coming out of my ceiling. I work in a very old building so 
Um, I'm hoping that the leak doesn't grow and I don't have to move. So I'll uh, try and keep my attention to the presentation, but every now and again I'm looking behind me to see if that unknown substance is leaking a little bit closer to me. Mandy, so I have to say that is a first. I've had hundreds of <laughs> webinars, but that's a first. Very, well, it's a first for me too. It's, I, my building is very old. We're moving to a new one in two weeks, so the timing is clearly just right. So thank you everyone for uh, signing in. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about what happens when families are in crisis and who goes to the emergency department, why they go, and, and what they might get or receive when they actually are in that visit. So for those of you that don't work in this setting, on a daily basis, kids and their families uh, go to the emergency department for a mental health crisis. And these crises may be the result of a, an existing problem that's deteriorated and known to the family or maybe because of an undiagnosed or undetected condition. So this may be a first time experience for some families. We know that the number of visits to emergency departments for mental health care has increased. US data shows that this has increased consistently over the past 10 years, um, but we do have a lack of comprehensive data in, in Canada. We've been fortunate in Alberta um, that all of our emergency departments uh, consistently report their data to our, our government and, and we're able to access those, access those. So the data that I'm going to talk about in the next couple slides are based on 101 emergency departments in Alberta, um, two pediatric emergency departments and then the rest are general emergency departments, so adult based institutions. In Alberta we noticed that visits increased dramatically about 15 percent from 2002 to 2006 and more recent data up into 2008 has shown there's been a little bit of a leveling off. It hasn't decreased but it hasn't increased and we're in the midst of looking at data from 2008 to present day um, to see where we're at right now. Surprising to me and, and my team was that most of the visits were made by youth um, and most of the visits were made for anxiety or stress, substance related matters, so substance abuse or misuse, and, and mood components. Um, there were significant increases for anxiety and stress. It was up 19% over that six year period and substance misuse increased by over 40% during that period. And, and I will point out that the substance misuse presentations, um, because we wanted to look at kids who got mental health care in the emergency department, we picked out kids that came in with a mental or behavioral disorder secondary to substance misuse. And so this, these data don't reflect accidents and injuries secondary to substance misuse, such as drinking and driving or, or trauma or injuries. And basically we figured out that every 103 minutes there's a kid that comes into one of our Alberta EDs for a mental health emergency. Unlike some of the things that Pat was talking about earlier about disparities, there are disparities for kids that do come into the emergency department. In the US, race, ethnicity and socioeconomic status have been linked to a crisis oriented pattern of care and that basically means these kids are using crisis services more. Um, a number of studies that have shown that minority children are less likely than Caucasian children to have received mental health care prior to that ED visit, and those studies are listed below. And there was one study in particular that looked at kids that came in, uh, it was in Washington State, and that African American kids were more likely than other kids to use the ED repeatedly for crisis mental health care. We were curious about uh, what this looked like in Alberta. And um, unfortunately, we found some disparities as well. And we've currently been working with decision makers uh, to communicate this evidence to them so we can talk about how we can best serve kids in hopefully what's going to become child-serving emergency services. So what you'll see here is for girls, and I'll present boys on the next slide. Um, and we'll in the gold. Is these are kids with um, first, who are basically First Nations kids. They have treaty status, and they're identified through their band identifiers. The registered without subsidy or the blue line are children and youth from families that aren't receiving any form of social support in Alberta. Government sponsored programs and welfare are children from families that are receiving some form of social support. And you'll see, um, but by the time kids are at about 10 years old, um, visits, um, and you'll see that on the y-axis there, visit rate per 100,000 kids and the age groups across, um, things start to dramatically change um, for youth and that Aboriginal girls are more likely to have visits, they have higher rates of visits than any other kids. Um, the, the curve is quite steep and we see the same thing and even more dramatically uh, when we look at the data for boys, that there's something going on for um, uh, Aboriginal young men over the age of 10 um, for coming into the emergency department. 
and I haven't presented the data here, but I, I will say that the, the diagnoses are actually comparable across the group, so it wouldn't be that we could say, well, these young men, um, they're more anxious or they're um, using more substances or there's more mood. It's actually comparable across all of this, and um, we don't know why because we don't have those variables in the data set, but there's clearly something going on for these young men. The Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and I'm, I'm hoping Dr. Mario Capelli is on the line here today, um, out of the hundred and so that are on, has really been a leader in, in terms of um, looking and trying to unpack why people are coming to the emergency department and, and what they're hoping to receive. And this was a recent study um, by Paula Cluche and um, Mario and their colleagues um, that asked caregivers and, and youth what their top concerns were when they came in uh, to the emergency department. And not surprising, these concerns were related to basic safety and emotional distress. And, and you can see them listed there, um, whether it's suicide-related thoughts or um, actions of self-harm and some mood components. What was exacerbating um, these uh, concerns about basic safety and emotional distress appeared to uh, the top stressors were school. Um, so that would be grades, um, uh, uh, friends, teachers, uh, lack of communication and things like that, learning difficulties. Uh, issues with parents related to fights, lack of communication, lack of involvement, etc., and then problems with friends and peers, um, not getting along with one's friends, dating issues, bullying, and so forth. So these are moderating um, some of the things that were going on in these kids' lives. Interestingly, from this study is that most patients weren't receiving mental health services at the time of the visit, and about half of the patients had no previous psychiatric diagnosis or history, suggesting that the emergency department may be the first door that many families open, um, but that hasn't been confirmed. This is a, a monster of a table, but I think it's quite important um, to talk about, so I, I put it up here and I'll, I promise I'll walk you through it. Um, so the CANS-MH is the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths Tool. It was developed by Dr. John Lyons, who's at the Univers uh, University of Ottawa now. And it's a clinometric tool. So basically its purpose is to facilitate a connection between the assessment that the person makes in the emergency department um, and then the plans or the services um, that are planned out for those kids. And so you'll see the CANS items there on the left, and you'll see CIW ratings there at the top, and CIW stands for crisis intervention worker. And so each of these scores are derived based on the history and the, and the story that the family and the, and the youth are communicating to the crisis intervention worker. And so a zero um, uh, coding, you'll see there in the one column, means no need for action. Uh, a score of one is watchful waiting or prevention. So monitoring or efforts to present whatever um, the concerns are um, from returning or from getting worse. Twos and threes are, are more action-oriented. So a two would indicate that an intervention is required because something is interfering in a notable way with that child or youth functioning. And three um, denotes immediate and intensive action. And so what you'll see here is that based on the crisis intervention workers' ratings, um, and I've highlighted the majority of percentages in each of the columns, that most kids are coming in or are coming in in distress. Um, but there's ne not necessarily a need for action on many of the things that they're describing um, to the crisis intervention workers in this study. Um, there are some things that uh, youth did talk about that uh, required watchful waiting, and, and those were more related to suicide-related risk um, and mood-related components and some stuff going on in the family in terms of parent-child relations. Um, and then you'll see in the column two where I've highlighted in green um, where there's more action-oriented items um, related to mood, so anxiety and depression, some oppositional behaviors um, going on for some youth, and then again, uh, parent-child relation problems. Uh, the CHEO group looked at the level of agreement. So when the child or when the youth or the parent comes in and what they're describing um, as important in terms of acuity, what's being identified as the clinician. And, and you can see here what I've circled in blue, there really is a high level of agreement. They're both you know, they were both agreeing on safety as a primary concern, but what was necessarily rated as actionable by the crisis intervention worker didn't not necessarily match up with what was rated as actionable by the youth um, during that visit. So the, I think from these studies, and, and really there aren't that many studies going on um, in Canada, so I, I, I present these just so you can get a view of the landscape here um, in our own backyard, is that when a youth and their parents come to the eMERGE, they are experiencing significant life stressors. Um, there may be things that we don't necessarily think that underpin um, that visit, and those could uh, be sociocultural based on um, the work that we've done here in Alberta. 
crisis visits do involve concerns about safety and self-harm. Um, we found they also involved uh, behaviors related to substance misuse and emotional distress. And this can be quite worrisome um, for a family, especially if this is the first time they're not quite sure what to do and where to go. Um, they may have ended up in the emergency department. One of the things that the CHEO study recommended, which I agree with wholeheartedly, um, is that empathy, support, and education are essential. What may not be as urgent to a clinician based on their professional experience um, and whatever tools that they're using to help explore the family's issues um, is urgent to a family, um, and that's the reason why they've come to the emergency department. And what we don't know yet, um, but what we do suspect, is that for many families that are coming in, this may be their first time contact with the healthcare system and they don't necessarily know how to navigate the mental health services that may or may not be available in their community. And I think this is particularly telling, as in a couple of slides I'll, I'll present to you what kind of care kids are getting in the emergency department um, and then maybe what might or might not happen after their visit. But first I'll go back to the CHEO study because what they did is they asked parents what they were hoping to receive when they come into the emergency department. And what was undeniable was that many parents were hoping to get some help and guidance for their kids, but they also wanted some resources and were, were hoping for an assessment. So you can see here almost 42% identified um, that they were hoping to receive some guidance for their kids. Almost a third of parents were hoping for some form of assessment or evaluation. Can we put a name to what's going on here and can you help me understand it? Um, and then just under 20% or a fifth of parents were hoping um, to get some resources. Maybe not surprising when you ask youth what some of the answers were. Um, there were 41, almost 41% wanted some help or guidance, but there were a large number that, that weren't quite sure what to expect um, or that didn't want anything. And um, the group from CHEO uh, wondered if this was related to parents bringing uh, the youth in and youth not necessarily bringing themselves in. Or it could be related to they just have never been to an emergency department uh, before and they don't even know what's going to happen and they've um, not been in a crisis before. So we were interested in, in what actually happens when you go into the emergency department and, and what kind of care a kid receives or what kind of services are available depends really on where they go and this shouldn't be surprising for most of the people that work in the healthcare system. Last year we surveyed uh, 15, uh, or 15 pediatric emergency departments across Canada. This was facilitated by Pediatric Emergency Research Canada which is a, a national research organization um, and we asked people what they've got. Um, in their eMERGE departments and, and we spoke to key contacts at, at each of the um, eMERGE departments. And so what you see here is that just over a third had a crisis intervention team, so this was a, a group of individuals brought together because of their mental health expertise and, and each one of them would lend something different to a mental health assessment or, or um, helping the family deal with the concerns when they came into the eMERGE department. 40% um, had a mental health nurse um, that was dedicated to helping children. Um, or a social worker, you can see just over 30%. Psychiatric consultation was a, a bit different. Now the majority of the emergency departments noted that psychiatry was on site. So if um, it was warranted that a psychiatric assessment was needed, you can call the doc on call and they can come downstairs to the emergency department. Um, there are two emergency departments um, that did not have this. And so what it meant was uh, calling another hospital, getting a hold of the psychiatrist, um, they may or may not come in depending on what the concerns were and at one other hospital it meant sending the child to a different hospital for the assessment and then sending them back. So three different emergency department visits um, for them for a psychiatry consult. There were a small percentage of emergency departments did note having an evidence-based guideline tool or policy that they use to guide the decisions and the care that they're providing. There has been some talk about urgent follow-up clinics. So these would be for families that are coming into crisis with their child or youth, they're discharged from the emergency department and they have an appointment with this urgent follow-up clinic. And this is um, offered in six of our eMERGE departments. So I, I do have a poll for the audience. Um, what service or clinical care do you feel is the most important for the eMERGE department? Uh, there are five options there, ranging from risk assessment all the way down to referral. Um, and this will be quite interesting to answer because I'll, I'll go on to talk about the care that actually kids are getting when they come in uh, to a couple of our emergency departments. Great. Great question, Mandy. Mandy, while well, people are completing the poll, um, mm -hmm. the survey of the 15 emergency departments, that was of, in, in children's hospitals. Yeah, it was pediatric emergency departments, that's right. right. And but most kids are seen in general emergency departments. You betcha, 80 percent. Okay. So we thought we'd start with our peds emergency departments. I mean, they're leaders in care. Um, and what services are they providing? Because I'm guaranteed if um, 
you know, those services aren't there, they're less likely in some smaller communities to be available in our, our general emergency department. Right. It's a start. There's yeah. way more general emergency departments. 15 seemed like a reasonable number. Yeah. They're just popping up right now. Thanks very much. All right. So interesting you say that risk assessment, 60% of you, um, is the most important, followed by referral. Um, I'll share a little bit about what we discovered uh, here in two emergency departments. So there are some American studies out there. There are very few and far between, and, and they're all retrospective studies, and, and this one is, is no different in some ways. But what differentiated the work that we um, have recently published is that um, we looked at the care that kids actually got. And the studies that are out there from the US are basically saying that children's mental health visits are resource intensive. When they come in, they stay a long time. The length of stay is really long. They use a lot of crisis intervention services, a lot of security, and so on and so forth. And we were thinking, well, length of stay may be long because psychiatry may not be there, or you've got to wait a while to consult, or they're actually waiting two hours before they see a crisis team. Um, and so that contributes to their length of stay. So we wanted to know what are people actually doing with kids when they come into the emergency department. So we picked two different emergency departments to compare the care, and, and one was the pediatric resource ED. So this is an emergency department in a children's hospital that has no on-site psychiatric resources. The other emergency department was a general emergency department that had psychiatric resources but no pediatric resources. Um, and I'll walk you through the results. So these are documented assessments. So my caveat to everybody on the line is it may have happened, but it wasn't documented. And if you're a healthcare provider uh, like myself and Pat, um, in the end, if it wasn't documented, it technically didn't happen. I'm, I'm hoping that the stats are actually, in real life, a little bit uh, larger than this. But you can see here that risk assessments were documented less than 50% of the time for kids that came into our pediatric ED and documented three quarter, almost three quarters of the time for our psychiatric ED. Not all kids got asked about questions about mood, and when we think back to the CHEO study with um, families having concerns about emotional stability and, and perhaps emotional dysregulation, um, that was asked and documented in less than a third of the cases at the pediatric ED in just over half of the kids that came in in, in the general ED. Physical assessments were surprising to me. Um, the kids that came that we looked at in our study, if they came to the pediatric ED, uh, the majority of them were going to get a physical assessment. They may not have gotten any mental health assessments documented, um, but the physician did perform a physical assessment, and less so at our psychiatric resource ED. Documented care. Um, brief counseling was really loosely defined. If anybody had documented something about saying some form of support to families, we coded it as brief counseling. So the quality isn't necessarily great, um, but it was documented that families got some form of social support, documented in less than half of charts at uh, the pediatric ED and more than three quarters of the time in our psychiatric resource ED. Now, contradictory to the US studies, there wasn't a lot of crisis intervention going on. Um, in our study, less than 7% for crisis intervention in terms of restraints and security, 5% in our, our general emergency department, and many kids did not get any medications um, for acting out or, or for some extreme behaviors. Psychiatry wasn't always consulted in our study, and, and you can see that the stats are quite low. So whatever services they were receiving from the physicians, the nurses, or the crisis teams, um, it didn't necessarily involve a psychiatric consult. And I'll just walk you through the discharge follow-up plan, knowing that people found this quite important, as do I, especially when we think about this may be the first door that people open um, is that emergency department visit. Um, we actually found um, that many families um, did not get any discharge follow-up plans, and, and we were unable to determine what that planning was in almost half of the charts at the pediatric ED and a third of the charts um, at the psychiatric resource ED. No. The, you know, verbally families may have been told what to go do, um, but a plan wasn't documented um, at all for these families. So many families are, are discharged, or we believe that many families are discharged without knowing what next steps to take. And this could be a concern for families that don't know our system. There are several homegrown initiatives across Canada right now um, with attempts to improve the care that kids are getting in our eMERGE departments and increasing access to post-ED um, services after the visit. Um, I'll just champion some of the work coming out of CHEO because they truly are leaders um, in this and I haven't seen any comparable stuff going on down in the US um, or abroad um, looking at developing a tool to assist our physicians in, in clinical decision making and in their assessment knowing that at least in our hospitals out here, the documentation isn't the best, 
um, which may reflect that we don't have the right assessments being conducted with kids, these tools could be instrumental um, not only in our pediatric eMERGE departments, but as Pat points out, our general eMERGE departments, which are not um, staffed with pediatricians. Um, many general eMERGE docs who may or may not have a long-standing history of working with kids and youth and may not know the questions um, to ask them or their families. We've started to champion um, a tool. It's an interbased program. It's called Check Your Drinking for kids that are coming in with substance-related complaints. Uh, we've partnered with IWK in Halifax and Alberta Children's just down in Calgary um, to deliver this to kids and we'll hopefully be testing its effectiveness. And basically what this program does, it asks kids uh, questions on their drinking. It's given to them after they've sobered up but before they go home. And it gives them personalized assessment feedback based on the answers that they provide. And our hopes are it's not mom or dad coming into the emergency department saying, what were you doing? You're drinking. You shouldn't have done that. Look at what you've done. It's not the doc or the nurse um, giving a lecture or saying, you know, you probably shouldn't have done that. Look what happened. It's youth giving answers and getting responses back based on those answers to give them some feedback on, on the consequences that may happen and the things that are going on with their body based on their drinking. So st stay tuned. Hopefully in a couple of years I'll have the same sorts of graphs that Pat just presented. So my last slide on, on the work that we've been doing in an area that I've been quite passionate about so the children and families who come to the, come to the eMERGE are in distress, and, and this visit may be the first time they are seeking help. Um, clinicians may not assess the crisis to be as acute. This extends beyond the CHEO study. We've seen it here um, anecdotally in Edmonton as well. Um, may not be as acute as what the child or parent is perceiving it to be, and there's a reason why they're going into the eMERGE. Nobody wants to sit there for a couple of hours if, unless they think it's really urgent. And in these cases, and for every kid, empathy, support, and education could be critical to helping family, um, families regroup, get sorted out, and figure out what they need to do for next steps. The thing that's probably most, one of the most concerning things to me is the type of care that a child or youth receives varies. And there are no national standards in Canada, and we haven't seen any abroad unless it's related to suicide risk and assessment. Um, to guide mental health assessment, care, and referral. And so basically, you get what you get, where you go, and who sees you. Um, and I strongly believe that access to evidence-based ED mental health care really is a basic right for families. It should be no different than when a kid comes in with a broken arm. We know exactly what we need to do with them, where they come in with a trauma. Um, it's prescriptive. You know what you need to do. Um, and I'd like to see mental health care go that way as well. So I'm just going to take the opportunity on um, behalf of Pat and I to summarize and ask one final question uh, to those that are still on the line. Um, and just to summarize, serious problems with appropriate access exist in Canada um, for child and adolescent mental health problems. Um, I think Pat pointed out, and I agree wholeheartedly, that the driving force of the services that are available and how we deliver them should be based on the needs of children, adolescents, and their families. And we really do need a level of engagement um, to move forward. The systems need to be rejigged. It's not been working to date. Some things work, some things don't. And we need new models um, to think about uh, some of the barriers that we're, we continue to have years in and years out. And so our question to you on, on behalf of the consortium and, and Cassie and, and Pat and myself um, is where the folks on the lines uh, feel there should be efforts placed in the next three years. And there are five answers there. And um, this may be one of those ones where you want to click all five. But if you could show preference to just one, that would be great. There are your results, Mandy. Do you, I hope you see them. I do. So 69% of respondents uh, answered number two, fostering collaborations across our child serving systems. And definitely for families with complex needs, that is a bear to navigate. And the second most popular answer was developing innovative workforce and care models. Um, to deal with some of the barriers that continue to be a problem. And our third most popular consultation with families, so some stakeholder engagement. So at this point, Elaine and, and Lisa, I guess Pat and I will turn it over to you to facilitate a Q&A &A period. Okay, so, so again, Pat and, and Mandy, thank you so much. Um, we do have a number of questions, and I'm going to turn this over at this point to our facilitator, Lisa Stromquist, who's going to put out the questions and we'll direct them to uh, Pat and Mandy. Sure, we have a few comments and a few questions and people can feel free to, to write in any other questions or comments uh, as we uh, start this, uh, this uh, section. So uh, from Chaya Kulkarni from uh, the Hospital for Sick Children, well I found the information shared in this presentation to be interesting, I'm startled at the omission of the mental health needs of infants and toddlers. 
I receive calls weekly from parents, physicians, social service workers, distraught because they cannot get mental health services for infants and toddlers. Why have you not addressed the unique needs of this group in the presentation? Will you reconsider and include at least one slide about the limited, if any, in some communities, availability of infant mental health expertise and services, and explain to those you reach uh, just, just how important early screening and intervention is critical? Well, I couldn't agree more that infants and toddlers are, uh, are, 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 even in the inadequacy of the research and the practice that we have, infants and toddlers with mental health uh, needs are, are underrepresented. And I, uh, I, uh, I don't apologize, but I just uh, acknowledge that uh, that wasn't part of our presentation. Yeah, I have to I echo what Pat says. It's those kiddos are a little bit too young for the work that I do. Um, I do know there are other experts, and maybe that points to us needing to do um, invite someone to do a webinar on this, because I, I agree it is critical. Uh, we don't see as many families, young families, in the eMERGE with those issues, and that may be because they're accessing different sorts of resources. Um, but I unfortunately don't have any information on that. That's, a, that's certainly something that the uh, consortium can look into and, and perhaps um, uh, so get some further information about having another presentation directly on these sorts of topics. Mm -hmm. Or under fives. Yeah. Ab absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, there's a question um, to you, Pat. Uh, some, uh, Christina McLean is asking, uh, did you say the coaches are volunteers? No, the, um, the coaches that we have been using in our studies are not volunteers. They're paid um, at a, uh, a rate that's uh, better than most call centers, but uh, not as, certainly not as much as a psychologist. We found that um, uh, we haven't done uh, work with volunteers, and that might be a, an opportunity. Uh, we found that uh, for our first uh, uh, efforts that we thought uh, that we would use um, uh, paid employees, we have more, con you have more control over them and more uh, ability to um, uh, to schedule and to and to make things happen, but the uh, possibility of using volunteers is one that we've uh, thought about but just haven't implemented. And uh, Don Buchanan's asking, what uh, the screening tools you are using? Um, the tools that we're using for the trials vary with different with different studies. In the uh, trial that I presented, we were using the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, what is it called? It's structured interview. <laughs> sorry, the structured interview for uh, uh, children's mental health. The case uh, case ads, and uh, in the uh, some of the other trials, we've been using the BCFPI, and in other situations, we're using uh, the uh, strengths and difficulties questionnaire. So it's varied with different studies and in different settings. Um, so uh, there are a number of of uh, of um, of measures that that have been used, and it depends on the needs of the uh, of the study that in terms of and the research, and then depends on the the preferences of the uh, contract. Uh, if we're contracted to to do work, we'll use whatever scale they want. Uh, in general, for our service work, we've been using the BCFPI, the Brief Child Family Phone Interview, which was developed by Chuck Cunningham. Mm -hmm. All right, I have. Um question from Jeffrey Thomas. The success of a teacher working with children struggling with mental illness is dependent on their level of understanding and empathy. What can be done at the school level to develop a staff in effectively working with these students? Right. Well, this is another area that, uh, that we didn't cover on, uh, in, our, in our presentation. And, and there are so many different areas in children's mental health that it's impossible to cover them all. Um, there is uh, uh, Clearly, there's a need for a lot more education of teachers in children's mental health. Certainly, in our own province, um, I uh, talk with the uh, I, I give a lecture almost every year to the uh, graduating class that are uh, in in education, and frequently, uh, many of them have not had any education about children's mental health problems. Um, currently, uh, Penny Corkum, a colleague of, of mine. Uh, is heading a study uh, that's looking at um, at, at teaching uh, with distance uh, methods uh, teachers about how to manage the kids with mental health problems in their classrooms. So I think we need a, and I think that one of the messages that uh, that Mandy and I want to put forward is we need a variety of different ways 
of, of uh, improving the mental health care of children. There's no one strategy that's likely to be um, uh, the, the panacea. So in, in terms of teachers, I, I think they need a lot more basic education, they need a lot more um, education in uh, continuing education, and we need to, to figure out different ways than the, what we have been using in the past, but also you know, the traditional ways of teaching teachers about this and providing the support. We need consultation models. We need shared care models with, uh, with teachers so that they can get better access to, uh, to mental health consultation. We need mental health people being more understanding and familiar with the way schools work. Mandy, you may have some more ideas on that. Well, I, I think it's a fair point. I, I know that anecdotally when families do come into the eMERGE department, they have been in chats with their teachers and, and their teachers aren't sure what to do. Um, and many do suggest to come into the eMERGE department. So I think education is key. And just to let people know, even education of our physicians and nurses is, is lacking and, and these are um, we're the leaders, and, and we need to do work there too. So um, certainly, teachers aren't uh, aren't exempt from that. And I, I think education needs to span um, all of our settings. And I think Pat's right. There's uh, many permutations to deliver it and to educate and, and get our workforce up to speed, as as there are uh, workforce and settings out there. Yeah, um, there's a there's the school-based mental health and uh, substance abuse consortium um, mm -hmm. uh, conducting a, a scan and a survey and evaluation of programs across the country, and I believe the results of that will uh, be shared in the spring of 2012. They should be all finished that. So hopefully that can um, some, shed some light on the good things that are happening out there and um, be able to, uh, to spread some of those programs. I think one of these questions are great, and even though Pat and I can't necessarily answer them because they're not necessarily our area, I, I do think they are highlighting future webinars and, and people to target. Um, to continue to move this agenda forward. So a couple, couple of points there, and then we, we do have a, we still have a few more questions. Um, but you know, when when you talk about who needs the education, you know, in one of the quick polls that uh, Pat and, and Mandy that you ran this afternoon, we we saw that people felt the majority of of care providers are in fact the primary care providers and. Hmm. And again, there, when you talk about education and training and a really good understanding of the challenges surrounding children and youth, infants, children and youth with mental health uh, problems, I, I think we have to really consider that as well. That's certainly feedback that I've received through the work that CAFC does many, many times. Yes, and I think the, uh, the, the one of the challenges that we have is, is that um, there's very, very little understanding, very uh, understanding of what happens in, to children when they go to primary care for uh, mental health problems. Okay. Um, and you know, it, 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 the uh, the confidence that many um, family physicians have in dealing with mental health problems with kids is is really quite limited. We do need to uh, to do more research on that, as well as an awful lot more training. But we don't even know what the effects are of primary care interventions in children's mental health. Exactly. So we need a lot more work in that area. Absolutely, because we have to recognize that those are the primary providers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I have uh, some more comments here and questions. So Ellen from McMaster Children's Hospital. We have some wonderful resources in children's mental health in the Hamilton area. However, the wait lists are horrendous. Addressing some interim supports for those on wait lists may be an area to focus on. Families feel forgotten between the initial crisis and the actual start of services, which can be quite lengthy. Yes, I'll, I'll start, because I, I know, Pat, your strongest families was, in fact, that. Uh, yes. We could agree more from the emergency department perspective. We know that um, the median wait time for kids is, is like a month um, before they see someone, um, and that's after a crisis. And so uh, we do need to have some interim supports. They may not even be on a wait list, for goodness sake. They may have you know, had one emergency department visit and then nothing because they didn't um, receive any discharge plans. Um, so Ellen, you're precisely right that a lot of work needs to be done in this. And, and Pat's been a leader in this. And the other, the other thing that's really important, I think, is, is that to realize that, that we need a variety of different ways to help families. Um, and so um, we, we're not. I, I don't think, for instance, our strongest families is the is the solution to everything, but it does provide one more way 
uh, for families to get help. And we're currently uh, providing that to uh, families in Calgary and in uh, Cape Breton and various other areas in Nova Scotia and to one health district in Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, so that, I, I, but I think that we have to start being really creative. There is a huge burden of, uh, of illness here and a lot of uh, good interventions that could be used and the kids that need the help just aren't getting it. I have uh, more uh, comments here. As an emergency psychiatrist, I would like to highlight the importance of resiliency factors such as strong deep attachments between child and a parent. It appears to be that for a variety of reasons, today's youth have weaker relationships, connections, attachments between their parents, which is us making them more vulnerable to the vicissitudes of life, such as stresses at school, with parents, etc. Even when parents or youth do not particularly identify attachment as an issue, invariably it is strengthening the parental bond, uh, which I have found universally effective in getting youth discharged or getting them over their anxiety. When you are closely attached to a parent, you feel secure and it no longer becomes the end of the world when there is a breakup. Uh, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or some bullying or anything like that. And my hope is to highlight the importance of strong parent-child relationships. So we need more social policy to strengthen these long-known resiliency factors. So I, I agree. I think that the CHEO study highlighted that family problems and, and the crisis intervention workers' assessments um, were a problem, and, and whether that's a function of attachment or poor attachment or disorganized attachment, I mean, I, that didn't assess that. but. Uh, we've also found that when kids come into the emergency department, the older they are, the more likely they come alone um, or with friends and, and where's mom and dad and sometimes mom and dad don't even come and get them from the emergency department. Um, and that may be a function of the issues that you're pointing out as well. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is that the, uh, you know, children are not randomly distributed to parents and, <laughs> and the, the children with the, uh, with the temperaments that are most difficult are often um, in, in, uh, are often in families where the parents have most difficulty. But in my experience, there are, there are very few parents that don't want the best for their kids. They may not know how to do it, they may not be delivering it, and strengthening the relationship between the, the child and the parent is, is obviously the first thing that we try and do in our intervention. Uh, and the simple little things like noticing good behavior, um, most parents of kids of disruptive behavior, four, five, six, seven, ten, they, when the kid is, is not being um, troublesome, they ignore the kid. And that's not because they're not good parents, that's because they don't know what to do because, my gosh, if I, don't, if I, if I do anything, I'll just start you know, the problems again. And so I, I think you know, the, the parents do want to know what to do and do want to, to help their kids. Oftentimes they don't do it, um, but we should be figuring out a lot of different ways to value it. And certainly um, the social policies to enhance that are important. Um, I'm very in favor of the, and, and uh, I, I don't know if the studies have been, any studies have been done to show it, but for instance, extended maternity leave is, um, is a very, um, potentially may well enhance the relationship between the, uh, the infant and, and, the, uh, and the mother when she has the time because of the, the, the very relatively good maternity leave provisions that we have here in Canada. So many circumstances around, you know, situations like that, and, and I think often they're not considered. So to, to your point, Pat, so I'll have a, from uh, Robin Mosher, please elaborate if possible on the relationship between poverty and mental health issues in children and youth. Is it possible that one of the reasons that this strong family outcomes for particular issues lose strength after one year because poverty persists in these families? Um, we don't know why uh, we have difficulty, but it's not uh, maintaining the uh, relationships or maintaining the, the, the effectiveness. Um, it's, um, it's not surprising that behavior change is difficult, and uh, it's not surprising to me at all that, uh, that after a year, um, people don't need a little bit more help. I mean, we, we have this notion oftentimes in mental health that, uh, that one intervention should last forever. Um, we don't have that same notion in the common cold. Um, you treat your, we don't even have a good treatment for a common cold, but you know, you get a cold, you get over it, you get it back again. 
Um, and, you know, as circumstances change, and certainly poverty produces huge stresses on families, and that's the, the re where the relationship comes. Um, if, you're, if you're poor, um, you're, you're likely to have poor housing. If you're poor, you're likely to have a less uh, robust um, uh, opportunities for, uh, uh, for activities. You're, you're not nearly as likely to have a good diet. You're more likely to have um, violence in your neighborhood. You're more likely to have uh, a poor school, um, a school with fewer resources uh, than, than, than if you're well off. So poverty is, a, uh, is, a, um, is pervasive in predicting um, mental health problems. And I, I think the uh, oftentimes, oftentimes, not perhaps not always, but oftentimes when when other factors are are related to mental health problems, it's because of the fact that they're poor, the people are poor, and that's where it, it comes. There's nothing inherent um, about many of the other situations, like uh, uh, ethnic group, that why should um, you know why should uh, immigrants have more problems. Uh, well, actually, I'm wrong there. They should have. They may have more problems because of trauma and difficulty that they've had, and uh, and other issues. But but I do think that poverty is important in in that, and uh, certainly social policies to to uh, to alleviate child poverty are uh, are ones that many many people have uh, have uh, indicated are incredibly important. But we've had very little progress here in Canada on that. So I have a question from Lori. In my experience as a mother of a child with several mental health issues, I have encountered much resistance from all the professionals and teachers I have gone to for help. I don't seem to want to recognize the symptoms of mental health issues and or diagnose mental health problems. I've been told everything from this is a parenting problem to he is just not an active learner to he is just not trying hard enough. Why do you think there is such resistance? Well, if I, if I knew the answer to that, they'd probably give me the Nobel Prize. But uh, I'll take some guesses at it. I think that the the I, I agree with the the mom that that's that certainly is is my experience in, in uh, anecdotally that that uh, a lot of times mental health problems are denied. I think part of the issue is is that um, professionals don't know what to do about it. Um, so if we don't know what to do about it, we then try and pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, there's also a tradition in uh, in the mental health areas to blame parents. Um, we uh, uh, we blame parents, and we particularly blame mothers um, if uh, if there's a, if there's a problem with the child. And that's not to say that, and as you know from my presentation, it's not to say that parents can't learn new skills that will be helpful. But that's not the same as blaming the parents. Um, and the uh, the the uh, the natural thing to do, oftentimes, that a parent naturally does is it may not be the right thing to do. So they need to learn new ways of doing them. And the resistance to uh, to to recognition of a problem, I think, fundamentally, is because they don't know what to do with it, or they don't have the resources to do uh, what they know should be done. Mandy, do you have any other comments on that? Oh, I think well said. It's it's unfortunate to hear that um, that's quite a common experience for parents. All right, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, so we'll just uh, finish off with uh, one or two last uh, questions. Uh, in the interest of time, we're almost done here. So your presentation highlights the dearth of provincial and national level data. Of course, this dovetails with the poor linkage and coordination of services. Could you please comment, read the current status and future directions to address this? Well, simple questions here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, well, I think that I think that there's a couple of things that that have to be done. Um, Health care itself is a provincial responsibility, and and the fragmentation into different systems has been pretty common. So national organizations such as as the one sponsoring this um, this webinar are incredibly important to link uh, people across provinces. We need to we need to insist um, that uh, that that we need to get better data um, from our government. So, and and the far too often um, what we've had is situations where each jurisdiction or each uh, sub jurisdiction 
uh, either doesn't collect any data or collects their own idiosyncratic data. In fact, idiosyncratic data isn't, uh, isn't so terrible if you can actually get people to collect data. And, and the information often just isn't available. It's very, very frustrating to try and figure out how to plan for better health services if the data isn't there. And we just have not invested sufficiently in, uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the collection of data for uh, planning purposes. Uh, Mandy? Yeah, I, I'd echo that and also add that um, it's, it is our responsibility to advocate for what is collected and often what's on the radar to collect at an administrative data level um, is not necessarily as helpful to those making policy and, and programmatic decisions or, or for, say, a researcher like myself trying to figure out um, why are, are Ab Aboriginal youth coming into the emergency department more than other kids. And so the data can only be as limited as what, as what we're collecting. And um, I, I advocate here in Alberta, and I'd uh, uh, strongly uh, suggest that others advocate, if you, if you want to know things and, and you want our government to collect things, um, we should voice that. And then let me, let, let me push that button a little bit further, and, and I, I'm, I have to be conscious of the time as well. But how do you do that, Mandy? Pat? I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if I'm doing it well. <laughs> like, how, how do you push that? That button, that, that it's a big button. How do you it push is, it? Well, and I mean, who do you even contact, right? I think for us it's been five years of, of building relationships and figuring out who's involved, and then all of a sudden the government changes and it's a whole new set of people. Um, so it's trying to be nimble uh, with who's in charge and, and how portfolios are changing and, and trying to be at the table when those decisions are being made and changes are being made. Um, I don't think there's any steadfast rule, and I'm having difficulty navigating it myself. It's a bit some quicksand out here in Alberta, so it's, uh, it's tough. Especially when your buildings are falling down around you. <laughs> the leak has stopped. Yeah. Oh, good. But the, I, I think, though, that, that uh, the organizations are the way to go. Uh, individuals are, are, can be very influential, uh, but organizations such as CAFSI and the consortium um, have to build the relationships with the uh, decision makers, both the bureaucrats and the politicians, and push the agenda. Um, now we, we've seen some outstanding failures in that when you know with, when the uh, when stats can uh, stop uh, you know re requiring the you know collection of data and and change their has changed their format and we have to be vigilant we have to let our members of parliament know that these are important Statist data sounds very boring but if you're going to do any planning you need the data I will give. A I, I don't have a good answer, but I, I mean, I think that uh, it, it's up to you, uh, Elaine, to, to to solve this problem. Well, Pat, I'll, I'll have that done on Monday, by Monday. But no, in all, in all in all seriousness, one one of the thoughts that literally just popped into mind is, you know, we've we've been able to bring together this afternoon, you know, upwards of uh, of 150 people from clinicians different, you know, interprofessional practitioners, family members have joined us. And maybe one of the things that we have to do, and we, we need to be strategic in this as well, though, is invite our, you know, we, we use the word government very loosely. But maybe what we need to do is have a session just like this with a special invitation to our government representatives, government representative from all levels and then bring our experts, bring Pat and Mandy and Mario Capelli and Paula Cloutier and, and you know, um, Stan Kutcher and so many, and I've left out about 500 other experts in the field just across our country. We have to bring our experts back to this forum and really, really promote a very strong advocacy uh, strategy, and, and maybe that's something we need to do. Instead of talking about our government, let's invite them to come and see the data that we do have and go from there. And that's something that I think we can do. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. We still have a number of questions left, but um, we are past our time already. So what I'm going to do is take the remaining questions, and I will um, find some answers for those questions and uh, send them all out to everybody that was registered online here okay. and with along with the link to the presentation. Oh, Thank really. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Just in, in closing, um, please, Pat and Mandy, I know everyone 
um, attending today really wants to join me in thanking you for an outstanding presentation and also for leading a very interactive um, session following those presentations. As Lisa said, everyone will have access to the presentations, the podcast is going to be created, and all of this will live on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, and it's a click of your, of your mouse um, from the CAFC website. Um, I also want to um, reassure everyone that uh, in terms of feedback back to the consortium, um, these questions that you've posed, our discussion, are, are maintained and we have this information and it's important information that will help us to continue to build um, our work um, really on your behalf. So Pat, Mandy, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our participants. And I also want to thank our facilitator, par excellence Lisa Stromquist, for her leadership today as well. Happy weekend, everybody, and we will be back in touch soon. Bye now.